Lastly, let's look at the focused renal ultrasound exam. What are the focused clinical questions here? Well, first, is hydronephrosis present? And second, we could also do this exam to look if the patient has a distended urinary bladder and obtain bladder volume measurements. So let me bring this point up early. Hydronephrosis is going to be an indirect finding in patients with an obstructive uropathy. Unless you definitively see the stone, it's within your differential you have to consider that this hydronephrosis could be Intrins due to intrinsic or extrinsic compression of the ureter. Exam essentials. Patients should be in a supine position to start off, although you can turn them into a decubitus position in order to better evaluate each kidney. I prefer the 2 to 5 megahertz large footprint curvilinear transducer here, although you could use a phased array transducer. There's no patient preparation required. Although at times patient assistance can be helpful, you can have them take in a deep breath during the exam to better visualize the kidneys and get them out of the way of the rib shadows. The coronal exams you're going to be familiar with because this is what you're doing when you have to do the periapatic and perisplenic windows of the FAST exam. So looking at the right kidney, you're going to have the indicator directed towards the patient's head you're going to be shooting in from a lateral to medial direction. So here you've got the transducer here, your lateral, medial, head, and foot. Here's the liver, and here's the kidney. Here you've got the renal parenchyma, and here you have the hyperechoic renal pelvis. I prefer doing the exam originally in the coronal plane because this is how you're going to be able to follow the minor to major calyces into the pelvis and into the ureter all in the same plane. Here's an example of a sweep of the right kidney in the coronal plane. You've got parenchyma and then you've got the hyperechoic pelvis here and you're just sweeping through the entire renal pelvis to look for the presence of any hydronephrosis, and we'll go over that in a second. When you scan, make sure that you're cutting through the renal pelvis. If you are cutting in this plane A or C, you could potentially miss hydronephrosis. You want to make sure that you sweep through where the renal pelvis opens up so you have good visualization of the renal pelvis. Here's the left kidney in a coronal plane. Again, indicators up towards the head. You're shooting in from lateral to medial. You could do this with the patient's supine or in the right lateral decubitus position, but here you've got transducer, lateral, medial, head, foot. Here you see the inferior tip of the spleen. Here you see the kidney, and you can see the surrounding renal parenchyma, and here's the hyperechoic renal pelvis. Right here is an example of the left uh, kidney in the coronal plane. And you can see, here's the renal pel or the renal parenchyma, here's the renal pelvis, and you can see that we're sweeping through, and here we are into the area where the opening of the uh, renal pelvis is, and this is how we're going to best visualize the presence of hydronephrosis. When you have the patient who presents with suspected ureteral colic, what would you expect to find sonographically? You would expect to find unilateral hydronephrosis. Remember, if you see bilateral hydronephrosis, you have to think of a more distal obstruction, not a single ureteral obstruction. It's important to also remember this is an indirect finding in somebody who recently developed this ureteral obstruction and is perhaps dehydrated, you may not initially see hydronephrosis. You may also see you know, perinephric fluid. These are, in a sense, urinomas. And this is due to a uh, rupture of the minor calyces due to increased pressure. If you're able to follow the ureter down, you may see the presence of hydroureter. Although the specificities are the although the sensitivity of uh, the detection of ureteral stones is not the greatest, it's possible that you may be able to find proximal UPJ stones or distal UVJ stones down by the bladder.
you can also look for urine jets. Here you have hydronephrosis, and it's a dilatation of the collecting system. And you want to make sure that you can connect the minor into the major calyces into the pelvis so that you're not confusing multiple uh, renal cysts for being hydronephrosis. Make sure that you can connect the tributaries that they all connect. And remember, this can be due to either intrinsic or extrinsic ureteral obstruction. Here are the various grading schemes for hydronephrosis. Here's a patient with very mild hydronephrosis. You've got some dilatation of the pelvis here, but it does not extend into the minor calyces. Here you have more fullness in the renal pelvis and you're starting to see it branch into the minor calyces. In severe hydronephrosis, you're going to see more significant dilatation of the renal pelvis and you're going to be able to see dilatation of the minor calyces. In chronic severe hydronephrosis, again, you're going to see marked dilatation of the renal pelvis, you're going to see dilatation of the minor calyces, and you're also going to see thinning of the renal parenchyma to less than 15 millimeters. Now let's look at some examples of hydronephrosis. Here's a patient that has severe hydronephrosis. You can see minor calyces connecting into the major calyces into the renal pelvis and going down into the proximal ureter. So I know, this, I know that these are not cysts because I can see how they all connect and that this is a dilated collecting system. Here's another patient that has severe hydronephrosis. You can see that all these areas connect, that you're going from the minor into the major calyces into the pelvis. But there's something else that should stick out to you here. Uncomplicated hydronephrosis, the fluid within the collecting system should be anechoic. If you look here, this fluid is echogenic. So this is more consistent with pyonephrosis. It could also be blood, but this was a patient who had an obstruction for about 8 to 10 days and was now febrile to 103 degrees. And they were ultimately uh, stented and this patient was found to have pyonephrosis. Remember, this is a big point. Collecting system should appear anechoic. If it's echogenic, then that's either blood within there or purulent debris. Here's a patient with moderate hydronephrosis. You can see, here's the dilated renal pelvis. You can also see the minor calyces here and they're all connecting and draining into the renal pelvis. You can also follow a little bit of the proximal ureter and here I can see evidence of the offending stone here. So this was a patient who had a proximal UPJ stone. Now here's a patient that has mild hydronephrosis. You can see that there's some dilatation here of the pelvis and it looks like it's extending into the proximal ureter. You're really not seeing any extension into the minor calyces here. When I see mild hydronephrosis, the thing that has to come, you know, as a potential differential is, is this really hydro or is this a prominent renal vessel? So when I see mild hydronephrosis, I will throw color Doppler on to uh, verify whether it's a vessel or not. Here's a transverse view of the right kidney, and you can see here's a vessel here, but this is the mild hydronephrosis. Let me go over another pitfall here, and that's an extra, a dilated extra renal pelvis. You'll see these not uncommonly, and what you'll end up seeing is, is a large anechoic or a, anything from a small to large area within the extra renal pelvis, but you won't see dilatation into the minor calyces. Here's a patient that came in with right upper or uh, right flank pain, went ahead and scanned the kidney coronally, and this is actually quite impressive. There's massive, um, there's a massive circular anechoic structure here by the renal pelvis. If you look, 
there's a little bit of there's some prominence here of the um, pelvis and dilatation but this is actually quite impressive here if we take a look at it in a transverse plane you can see here's this very dilated extra renal pelvis now if this was all due to an obstruction you would expect that the thinner you know major to minor calyces would also be affected and that there would be significant dilatation here also but it's only dilated here in the extra renal uh, pelvic or pelvis region and so this was a patient who did not have hydronephrosis this patient had a dilated extra renal pelvis it obviously is quite impressive when you look at it these are two transverse views of the kidney on two separate patients this patient on the right here has a dilated extra renal pelvis here you can see that there's dilatation here that's extra renal but you're not seeing any um, dilatation within the renal pelvis that extends into the major or minor calyces and we can contrast this with somebody who does have hydronephrosis you can see here there's dilatation of the renal pelvis also into the extra renal region but if you look there's also significant dilatation of the major into the minor calyces you can also see that the patient has a little bit of free fluid around the kidney which in this case was a urinoma but this is a patient who has an obstructive uropathy this is a patient with an extra renal pelvis so you can clearly see there's dilatation and extension into the major and minor calyces you don't see that with an extra renal pelvis lastly let's look at bladder volume if you take three orthogonal measurements of the bladder you're going to be able to obtain a bladder volume and all the machines will have calculation packages to do that it's basically the plus and the minus sign you're just taking three orthogonal measurements and this can be used in assessing post void residuals or someone who comes in with abdominal distension that you're concerned may have a dilated or may have a um, distended urinary bladder this beats putting a foley in the patient and it's relatively uh, easy to do so let's sum up how to use the focused renal ultrasound exam if you have a patient who you think has an obstructive uropathy if you see pi positive unilateral hydro you can treat as an obstructive uropathy provided no other high-risk findings are present make sure that the fluid within the collecting system is anechoic if you don't see hydronephrosis obstructive uropathy is less likely you can consider other causes if the patient came in with only 30 minutes of pain and appears dehydrated you may want to hydrate the patient and observe them and rescan them to see if unilateral hydro develops if you see bilateral hydro you've got to consider a distal obstruction and remember hydronephrosis can be the result of extrinsic compression this can occur with a gravid uterus this can also occur with an enlarged abdominal aortic aneurysm so if you've got the 75 year old who comes in with severe flank pain and you see left unilateral hydronephrosis scan the aorta these are patient patients that are at risk for a ruptured triple a